Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, inviting you to hop aboard the Bible bus as we begin a terrific journey through the New Testament book of Hebrews. Now, to introduce this study, we've got a special message from our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. We have come now to one of the great books of the Bible, and that is the Epistle to the Hebrews. We are back in the New Testament, and we are moving toward the end of the New Testament. Now, when I come to the book of Hebrews, I always heave a sigh of relief because we're getting near the end of the five-year program, and it's downhill now all the way. In the past, when we have gone through the Bible in a -a two-and-a-half-year program and the other five-year program, and even when I had a one-year program, When we got near to the end of the Bible, we found out we'd used up our time, and as a result, why we rushed through the last few books of the Bible. Well, this time it's going to be different, because I purposely have reserved more time for the books that we're coming to now, beginning with the one today and continuing on through the New Testament and also through the remainder of the Old Testament. We have finished the major prophets now. We finished Daniel last time. So we have before us for the year that is ahead of us, a little over a year, we have the minor prophets, and we also have from Hebrews through the book of Revelation. Now, I've had quite a few letters that have come to us from people who say, I try to believe, and they always go back to the fact that They heard this somewhere from an evangelist or a preacher somewhere telling people that they're to believe and that they're to try to believe. And these folk, very frankly, write and said they try it, but they just can't force themselves to do it. What in the world is the matter? Well, let me be very candid now for just a few minutes with you. I may be just a little theological, but I don't like to get into that area when we hear a great deal today about that you are to repent of your sins and follow a little ritual, you are to try to believe and take those steps. Well, when you and I come into this world, we come in as lost sinners. Do you want a picture of us as we come into this world? There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They're together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Now may I say to you that the Word of God says there is none that seeketh after God. And therefore, you and I in our lost estate, are not seeking after God. And all this human effort to say, I try to believe, well, how then are you going to believe? Well, my friend, and there is today a hunger that apparently the Spirit of God is putting in the hearts of many people, and the Spirit of God has to be the first one to move, because you see, You're born again. You're born of water and the Word and the Spirit. And I believe the Word is the water that is mentioned in Scripture, that you must be born of the water of the Word of God and of the Spirit of God. Now, when you spend all this effort of trying psychologically to work this up, you're working on an old nature that has no capacity for God, You're not righteous. You're not really seeking after God. You need to use the Word of God. And only the Word of God is effective. Born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, of the Word of God that liveth and abideth forever. Now, if you sincerely are saying to yourself, I want to believe, then, my friend, the answer to that, therefore, is to get into the Word of God. You can't have confidence in any person to trust that person until you know that person. I was speaking in a church in a 
certain city and I had a car and I asked the way back to the hotel and I got two or three directions, but there was a man there that I knew very well. And so I went over and asked him and he laughed and he said, well, those other two would probably get you there, but let me give you the easy way. And you know, I followed that man's way and you know the reason I did it, I knew him. The only way that you can know God, this is life eternal, that you might know God. How are you going to know him? You can only know him through the word of God. Now, my friend, if you really say you are trying to trust God, then get off of this psychological end. You're working with an old dead nature. Come to the word of God and start reading the word of God and ask God to make it real to you if you really mean business. And God will do that because he's done it for multitudes of people that we know of. Come to the word of God. Use the word of God. That's the only thing. The miracle that's in the world today is the word of God. It is a miracle book. We know it's a miracle book because we see what it's doing today in many different languages throughout the world. God is using it. And we know that that is taking place. Now, if you really mean business, and you're giving me this question, I get it now from many people. I'm trying to trust God. Will you study the epistle to the Hebrews with me? If you mean business with God, if you go through the epistle to the Hebrews, I think you'll be a born-again Christian when you get through. Will you do that? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that helps us to know you. As we study Hebrews, we would ask for your living and active words to come alive in our hearts and to help us trust you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, how do you begin an epistle like the epistle to the Hebrews? I have done more work on the beginning of this epistle than I have on any other book that we have considered so far. Because I consider this epistle right along by the side of the epistle to the Romans, where I've given a great deal of time, and I know no other book that I would put above the epistle to the Romans. And I wondered how I'd begin. And I'm going to do something just a little bit novel today. I have before me some very excellent books on the epistle to the Hebrews. And I'm going to let these men begin the epistle to the Hebrews for me because each one of them, though he makes a different statement, he's making a statement that's all important and one I would like to make. Therefore, I'd like for you to hear the statement of Dr. G. Campbell Morgan in his book, God's last word to man. And will you listen to this statement now that I'd like to pass on to you? The letter to the Hebrews has an especial value today because there is abroad a very widespread conception of Christ which is lower than that of the New Testament. To illustrate what I mean by this, A recent writer has said, one of the best things we can say about human nature is this, that whenever a situation occurs which can only be solved by an individual laying down his life for his friends, some heroic person is certain to come forth sooner or later and offer himself as the victim, a courteous, to leap into the gulf, a Socrates to drink the hemlock, a Christ to get himself crucified on Calvary. Now that's the end of the quotation from a liberal that Dr. Morgan quotes. And he's using that to illustrate that there is a low view concerning Christ. Now if that was true in his day, it's more so in our day. So let me conclude this opening statement of Dr. Morgan, and I'm reading again. I'm not proposing to discuss that at any length. To place Christ in that connection is, to me, 
little short of blasphemy. We may properly speak of a courteous, a Socrates, but when we speak of a Christ, our reference to him is not only out of harmony with the New Testament presentation, but implicitly a contradiction of what it declares concerning the uniqueness of his person. And friends, that concludes the quotation, and that is a tremendous beginning for Hebrews. But let me quote another writer and another emphasis, by the way. It, too, is all important, and I'm quoting now from Dr. William Pettengill. His book is entitled Into the Holiest, Simple Studies in Hebrews. Now, I'm reading his opening statement. From Adam to Moses, through 2,500 years, and from Moses to Malachi, through 1,100 years, the prophets were speaking for God to man. But at the end of the 3,600 years, their revelation of God was only partial. Then after a silence of 400 years, when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, and in that Son, the revelation of God is perfect. Now that, my friend, is another tremendous statement. Now I'm going to give a third introduction to the epistle to the Hebrews, and I'm quoting now another excellent book, Dr. Schuyler English, Studies in the Epistle to the Hebrews. And I'd like for you to listen to his opening statement in the introduction. The Epistle to the Hebrews, one of the most important books of the New Testament in that it contains some of the chief doctrines of the Christian faith, is as well a book of infinite logic and great beauty. To read it is to breathe the atmosphere of heaven itself. To study it is to partake of strong spiritual meat. To abide in its teachings is to be led from immaturity to maturity in the knowledge of Christian truth and of Christ himself. It is to go on unto perfection. Now, here is a further statement. The theme of the epistle to the Hebrews, the only book of the New Testament in which our Lord is presented in his high priestly office, is the supreme glory of Christ, the Son of God and Son of Man. Again, let me say, that is a tremendous statement to make. Now, I have a fourth one, and I turn to Sir Robert Anderson. His book is entitled, The Hebrews Epistle. I hope that as we go through this epistle, I'll be able to emphasize this which he emphasizes. This introduction, I trust, may somehow or another, clarify the thought. And I lift this out of his introduction. That the professing church on earth is the true vine, this is the daring and impious lie of the apostasy. That it is the olive tree is a delusion shared by the mass of Christians in the churches of the Reformation. But the teaching of Scripture is explicit that Christ himself is the vine and Israel the olive. For God hath not cast away his people whom he foreknew. And this epistle to the Hebrews was not accepted by the Western church for a long time, and the reason is found at this particular juncture, because the church wanted to usurp the place of Israel 
and they adopted all the promises and spiritualized them and took them for themselves and rejected God's purposes in the nation Israel. And as a result, you'll find that the church in those early days became actually anti-Semitic and persecuted the Jew. To say that God is through with the nation Israel is a sad blunder. And I trust that this epistle may be helpful to us in understanding the great truth that a Hebrew is a Hebrew, and that when he becomes a Christian, he actually is still a Hebrew. Just as when you and I become a child of God, it doesn't change our nationality at all, but it brings us into a new something, a new body of believers called the church. And God's calling out of both Jew and Gentile a people to his name. Now, when that's consummated, God will take his church out of the world and he will pursue his purpose with the nation Israel, fulfilling all of his promises to them and through them to the Gentile world in that day. I believe this epistle will help us. These are four great introductions to the epistle to the Hebrews, and I am indebted to these four very wonderful expositors of the Word of God for helping us get on the springboard, and now we can plunge into the water of the Word today. Now, I have another introductory matter that we must consider, and it's always been a very mooted question, and that is, who is the human author of the epistle to the Hebrews? If you are acquainted with the literature of the Scripture, you recognize that there's been no unanimity of thought and no agreement as to who is the author. I wrote a thesis when I was in seminary as a seminary student because this problem interests me. In fact, it enthralled me, and I spent time with it. And I wrote a thesis on the authorship of the Hebrews, and I attempted to sustain the thesis that Paul, the apostle, is the author. Now, I'm not going into all of that technical and scholarly background because it becomes a little tedious and tiresome to those listening on radio who are not really concerned about that. And after all, the human author is unimportant. The important thing is this is part of the inspired Word of God. But if you're interested in it, I am taking this thesis that I wrote as a seminary student, and I've made a very few changes in it. In fact, practically none. I have included some up-to-date material, but you're going to read what a dogmatic green seminary student would write. Now, I take a very dogmatic position there, which very candidly I would not attempt to take today, other than I may not be as dogmatic, but I still believe Paul is the author. Now, to pass this off in a light vein, let me say this. I believe Paul was the author. I have a thesis on it. We put it now in print, and you can have a copy of it, but you'll have to ask for it. And if you want it, we'd be delighted to send it to you. Now, if you want a reason why I believe Paul wrote it, this is not in the thesis, but here is a reason. If Paul did not write the epistle to the Hebrews, it would mean that he only wrote 13 epistles. And do you think he would have stopped at that unlucky number? Well, I don't. I think he wrote Hebrews, and that would make 14. So we're going to let it go in that light vein today. And hopefully, if you want to pursue this, we'll send you the thesis. Now, when I wrote that thesis as a seminary student, I thought I had solved the problem and that the world would be in agreement that Paul wrote Hebrews. But I find out that today there's just as much disagreement 
before I wrote the thesis, but if you would like to know our presentation, we'll send that to you. I believe that he wrote it. I recognize that John Calvin didn't accept it, Martin Luther did not accept it, and many others of the past did not. But on the other side, a great many others did. Regardless who the human author is, it would make no difference. The important thing is it's part of the inspired Word of God. And I believe that there is good and sufficient reason for Paul changing his style and for not giving us his name in the epistle. We'll have occasion to call attention to that as we go along. Now there's another introductory matter that I think I ought to mention. When was it written? Somebody says, why is that so important? Well, it's very important in this sense. There have been many, even sound scholars, that have taken the position that it was written after 70 A.D. Some give the date 85 or 86 A.D., others up in the 90s. If you read the epistle, I think that you have to come to the conclusion that the temple at Jerusalem was still standing when Paul wrote this epistle. Of course, that means it had to be written before 70 A.D. because Titus, the Roman, destroyed the temple in 70 A.D. And Paul had already gone to be with the Lord. As he said, he'd finished his course and he had already turned in his report so that if Paul wrote it, which we believe, it had to be written before 70 A.D. Now, let me say something relative to the epistle that may place it in your mind on a very high plane. We'd like for it to be that. Coleridge said that Romans reveal the necessity of the Christian faith, but that Hebrews reveal the superiority of the Christian faith. That thought will run all the way through this epistle. The comparative adjective better is used 13 times in this epistle. You have here that statement, which I think is very important, the fact of the matter, it would be like this. Paul is saying, and probably I ought not to be so dogmatic as to say Paul says, let's say that the epistle to the Hebrews says that the law was good and that now under Christ, under grace, it's better, but that glory is coming and that's going to be the best. So what you have in the epistle to the Hebrews is that which is better. And the word perfect occurs 15 times with cognate words, of course. And then it is an epistle that challenges us. You'll find in it, let us, let us. That occurs 13 times. In fact, this is an epistle that contains the meat of the word but it also has a salad that goes with it. Let us, let us. And then the word let occurs five times. And I think that there are two verses that convey to us this better way. In Hebrews 3, 1, the writer says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession Christ Jesus, we're to consider him. And then again, in Hebrews 12, 3, the challenge is given to us, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Friends, for the next few weeks, we are going to consider him because that's what we're told to do here consider him. And I'm convinced that that is the most important thing that any Christian can do. Now, in the first 10 chapters, we're going to see that Christ is better than the Old Testament economy. He's 
better. And we'll be in the doctrinal section. And then chapters 11 through 13, Christ brings better benefits and duties to us today. And that's the practical side. And by the way, that conforms to the way Paul writes, as he does in all of his epistles. So until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. If you'd maybe like a little more information about how you can know God personally or how to deepen your personal study of God's Word, then you need to visit us at ttb.org or you can call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. I'm Steve Schwetz. For all of us here at Through the Bible, we're grateful for God's grace and mercy in your lives and asking Him to draw you closer to His heart as you study His Word. See you on Monday. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.